Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight, specifically the survivor for Tome 13, Michaela Reed, and her brand new story, and soon the fog. Avid viewers will remember my disdain for Michaela that I expressed in what was almost certainly my worst ever video, a critique of the character I lodged on her release that was loaded with spite and my general distaste for DVD at that time. I actually recognised this in a recent video and resolved to do better when it came time to talk about Michaela's tone, to give the character a fair shake and reconsider my original criticisms of the character. This video was made before Michaela's tome came out, and now that it's here and I've given it a good read through, I've got to say, I'm a pretty big fan of what we wound up with. Far from the exhaustive story breaking down Michaela's whole life that we got in her base story, and soon the fog chooses to focus on her ability to see overlaps into the entity's realm. Something that's become increasingly prominent as a story element for various characters over the past year. Back when Roots of Dread released earlier in the year, the arrival of Hattie Kaur as a survivor elaborated on the nature of the otherworldly powers she had that were set up in prior times. The ability for her to see overlaps between the real world and the world of the entity. And she made a web series with her brother Jordan, documenting his locations and events around the world. But Hattie isn't the only one who can perceive these lapses in our reality. In Tome 12, it's all but stated that Carmina Mora, the artist, could see them too. That's why she could see the crows that followed her throughout her life, despite crows not living in South America. The stories in Tome 12 suggest that Carmina's visions and to the overlaps, which she inherited from her mother, were channelled into her artwork and the Black Veil, the cult worshipping the entity, went after her not because of her political affiliations, but because she knew what they were up to, and were behind her mother and brother's assassinations. And soon the fog introduces Michaela as another entity sensitive person, except it does it in quite a different way than what we're used to. Michaela doesn't go on any adventures, fight any monsters, or expose any great evil, at least not so the contents of her own mind. What Michaela does instead is exactly what she does best. She simply sees and records what she sees as stories, as any aspiring writer with interest in the supernatural world would. Okay, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's wind it back and start at the beginning. Right, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start off by going back, looking at Michaela's base story and seeing the kind of character that its exhaustive breakdown of her life shows to us, and then we're going to go back to the time and take a look at how that setup gets paid off. Michaela is a young woman working as a barista at the Moonstone Coffee Shop, a hipster coffee shop in the artsy end of town. It's quite a mundane life compared to the high adventure and intrigue characters like Elder D, Jonah or Hardy. But that doesn't mean the life she leads lacks the complexity and depth that theirs do. Most of Michaela's story talks about her life outside the Moonstone. Her ambitions in life far exceed preparing coffee for patrons. She makes body butters and soaps which she hopes to turn from a hobby into a business. She's also an aspiring writer who loves making horror stories and always goes ham every Halloween to deliver the spookiest experience she can to her friends and family. This love of writing forms the core of her base story. Her friend Julian enters her into a scary story competition for the Endless Halloween Festival the prize money for which would allow her to launch her line of body butters and bath products and finally let her get away from the Moonstone. The idea of creating a small business and becoming self-sufficient is an aspiration that a lot of young people today have. A life of never having to answer to ignorant bosses that avoids the exploitation inherent to many bog standard 9 to 5s. It's insanely attractive. And Michaela is a great representative for that young, wannabe professional demographic that so many of us aim to become. Michaela's lore also touches on her beliefs as a witch, which is easily the part of the characterization that I touched on the least in my prior video on her, because frankly, I didn't make the effort to understand it. So I'm going to talk here for a second about what Wicca is, because it's key to understanding what makes Michaela tick. Here I am, making the effort this time. But before we continue, I'd like to remind you that this video, along with everything on the channel, is brought to you by Wraith Energy, the delicious energy drink that gives you long-lasting energy without the crash. Preparing that all-important first drink of Wraith is very simple. All you need is a scoop or sachet of powder, add it to 400 to 500 milliliters of water, and give it a right good shake. And then you've got yourself a long-lasting, delicious energy drink that will keep you energized throughout the day. 
My personal favourite is Tropical Punch, but if you're brand new to Wraith, I'd recommend picking up a Wraith Crate or a starter bundle. Both come with a shaker and a wide variety of sachets, so you can figure out what flavour is right for you. Friends who've tried Wraith have told me it's really helped them get through exam season, but it also makes an excellent festive gift for the gamer in your life, or just yourself. If you're looking to pick up some Wraith energy this holiday season, check out the link in the description and use code PIXEL20 for 20% off at checkout. Now, back to Michaela. Wicca is a pagan religion in practice across the world that originated in the 1940s in the UK from the work of one Gerald Gardner. Look at this man's hair, holy shit, that is the definition of Riz. Gardner wrote many of the texts and established many of the traditions that modern Wiccans follow. But it isn't a dogmatic faith like, say, the Abrahamic religions. There's no central authority and doctrine giving you strict rules on how you live your life. As long as you're not hurting anyone, then you're more or less free to seek your own spiritual fulfilment however you wish. The Wiccan read, harm none and do as you will, more or less sums it up. Wiccan practitioners, who refer to themselves as witches, will often develop their own unique practices to have spiritual experiences in whatever fashion works best for them. A lot of the time this involves rituals and meetings between practitioners to get closer to the divine, that date back to pre-Christian pagan practices, and yet for a belief system so deeply rooted in traditional practices, it's had a potentially surprising resurgence in recent years, with the internet becoming a tool to bring an inherently isolated and decentralised group of practitioners together, and spread the word in an age where organised religion like Christianity becomes shrouded in more and more public doubt. Wicca is something that's both incredibly old, originating in pagan traditions that are older than the Roman Empire, and kind of a symbol of the modern times, as it spread across the world through the internet, including, yes, TikTok. The amalgamation of the modern and traditional is a core part of Michaela's character. As I said before, her life as someone stuck in a dead-end job trying to make something more of herself is a very modern predicament. And yet her job is at a hipster coffee shop. A place that typically discards the trappings of modernity for a more earthy, lived-in look. And the business she's trying to start is one making homemade bath products and soaps. I mean, she's not exactly streaming League of Legends on Twitch or designing an app now, is she? The only part of her characterization that I was still struggling to properly grasp was the whole magic thing. Like, Michaela's base story exhibits the entity taking a particular interest in her, but the story presents her as more of a hapless victim of its intrusions rather than a magical practitioner communing with it. If anything, she's trying to actively avoid it. She attempts to dispel its dark energies and even resorts to getting her friend Julian to record her while she sleeps so she can figure out the truth behind her increasingly vivid nightmares. This always perplexed me when Behaviour tried very, very hard to present her as the magical witchy girl survivor. Because in Dead by Daylight, magical witchy stuff isn't new, and Michaela's lore barely touches on it. When we've had a literal voodoo shaman as a killer for years now, and went on to get not one but two survivors in 2022 with explicit arcane powers, it begs the question of why Michaela being the witch with the magic touch was such a big deal. She was a survivor to introduce boon totems to the game, and the chapter's marketing was based heavily around her witchiness down to her visual design. And yet basically none of it comes through in her lore. It talks about her magic feeling drained at one point, but what does that actually entail? How is it materially different and worse than how she normally feels? Does she have actual tangible magical powers like Hadi and Yoichi, or is it just a part of her Wiccan belief system? <laughs> what I'm basically asking here is, is Michaela a spiritual person who uses her Wiccan rituals and practices to feel closer to divinity and that's what she perceives and calls magic? Or is she Gandalf in leggings and a hat she bought from a charity shop? This is what I was hoping and soon the fog would answer. And when I first read it, I was a little disappointed that it doesn't really do that. On the topic of magic, it doesn't really say anything that the base law didn't. We're not shown any of Michaela's practices, rituals or spells, or whatever that she undertakes, part of her presumably Wiccan lifestyle. Instead, the focus is placed on her own flagging confidence as a writer, and how her very ordinary anxieties and worries about not being good enough are blurred more and more with the extraordinary visions of the entity that she experiences in her nightmares. But at the beginning of the story, 
her nightmares are rather more, um, let's say, material. The fears that writhe in her stomach like snakes aren't eldritch horrors from beyond reality, playing sadistic games of cat and mouse for all eternity, they are an audience and public speaking. What surprised me here is how much attention Michaela's tone story paid to her life as a writer. Almost nothing else about her life is ever showcased, and if you ask me, that plays to Michaela's greatest strength as a character. Her very normal life and ambitions that make her a relatable character to many readers. And soon the fog concerning itself mostly with Michaela's writing and her pursuit of telling great stories focuses the narrative in a fairly elegant way. For Michaela, writing is her normal life, especially around the Halloween season, and it gives us a window into her little anxieties, her day to day problems that everyone, especially creatives, just sort of learn to live with on a constant basis. It establishes a baseline for her life, a normal state of passive anxiety that she has to deal with before the story's events disrupt that status quo. That, I think, is why the language used by her internal monologue in her story is so clinical. She uses terms like cortisol and amygdala, very scientific language to quantify her emotions in terms of a biological response. But all that shows us is that she's emotionally intelligent and knows how to verbalise those emotions in a way that shows she's lived with it for a long time. It's clear that Kayla knows what she's talking about. This isn't a one-off emotional impulse, but it's her regular state of being that she's dealt with for so long that she knows everything there is to know about it and understands it's perfectly normal for her body to act like this. Plus, she's a writer, a horror writer to boot. Understanding the biochemistry of anxiety and fear is kind of part of the deal. What writer worth their salt wouldn't do the research into the subject they were writing about? <laughs> uh, let's not answer that question. As the story goes on, and Michaela wallows in her anxieties, we come to understand where they truly came from. And in my opinion, this is the highlight of the whole story. We're taken back to her days in school, with her 10th grade English teacher, Mr. Brandies, ripping into her stories for not conforming to the rules that the story apparently should always adhere to. We've all had teachers like that, I'm sure. Marking you down for not showing your workings in maths class, even if you got the answer right. Not setting out an essay in the exact format they wanted, even if you've written it just fine. Being told that you're not good enough for completely arbitrary reasons, for a figure of authority you're meant to listen to and respect in school, can sit with you for a very long time. Especially if it's something that you're passionate about. Like Michaela clearly is about her writing. These memories also mention Michaela being dyslexic and her teachers struggling to accommodate that or understand it. This adds a whole new dimension to Michaela's educators being unable to really accommodate her, and the long-term effects that that's had on her development and confidence as a writer. It's been well established from those who study education and development that feedback from even a single teacher can make or break a student's confidence in long-lasting ways. See, from personal experiences, I was pretty lucky. I had really good English teachers who encouraged and supported my love of reading and digesting narratives. It's thanks to the support that I got on the university course I ended up getting onto, and eventually started this channel. So yeah, a good teacher can do a lot for you, but Michaela wasn't quite so lucky. The words of Mr. Brandy's, despite how much she clearly didn't respect the guy, stuck with her for a long time, and it took a lot for her to come out of her shell and stop creating with confidence again. It just turned out that what inspired that confidence may have been slightly worse than a shitty English teacher with nasty BO and a poor method of motivating students. Michaela starts to see things in her nightmares, visions of a world of blood and horror that simultaneously chill her to the bone and start to give her ideas. This is nothing really new. Her base story covered the nightmares of the entity's realm she was experiencing. But it's how and soon the fog chooses to frame them that I want to talk about. Because we're not shown her being hauled to a meat hook and impaled on it by some misshapen monster like in her base story. Instead, we're shown a woman, Claudette Morel, wandering the fog and hiding from a hollering giant with a chainsaw that we all know to be the hillbilly. Michaela projects herself inside Claudette's mind and body like a kind of super empathy stretching herself between the material world and the nightmare world of the entity. Later in the story, it happens again, this time reaching the consciousness of Meg Thomas. Ugh, 
and feeling that strength and athleticism as she runs for her life, adrenaline pumping through her body. For Michaela, it's an escape. A terrifying one, but an escape all the same. She takes her experiences and fears back with her to the real world, where she uses it to work on her stories. This is where Michaela sets herself apart from Hadi. While both of them can see into the Entity's realm, they treat it very differently. Hadi is an explorer, and an adventurer, for whom the horrors of another world are facts of life. But for Michaela, they're more of a fantasy. A strange other world to escape from the mundanity of her normal life. Well, it's more real and less fantasy than she might think, but that's kind of beside the point. The crux of Michaela's character throughout this whole story is how incredibly normal she is, and how she processes her anxieties reflect that. She doesn't spend her days fighting massive injustices or solving ancient mysteries. She's just a young woman trying to find her way in the world, and indulging in a simple escapism where the problems of the real world become too much for her to handle alone. Her aspirations are pretty normal, and that makes her situation and reactions understandable and makes her very rootable. You want to see her succeed and overcome her doubts. Between Hadi using her visions to stand up to the Entity's monsters, and Carmina channeling those visions into her works of art to form a rallying cry against tyranny, it's easy for us as readers to feel disillusioned with these overlaps, as a recurring story element, because they happen in ways that we can't really relate to, to people who are inherently exceptional. And soon the fog tries a fresh new take on this idea by presenting it as a manifestation of, and escape from, Michaela's personal doubts and anxieties. It takes the gigantic concept of deja vuism, the idea that stories in one universe are reality in another, and condenses it down into a tight narrative that makes it easily approachable for someone who isn't turbo obsessed with DVD storytelling ideas and conventions. It's a story that doesn't tell us a lot that we don't already know, but frames it in a digestible way, and the importance of that cannot be understated. I believed for a while that DVD's lore has been getting overcomplicated and too fixated on the multiverse, caught up in its own spiderweb of lore and complications, to the point that if you don't keep up with every single thing, all the time, you miss out on key details and make everything else far harder to understand than they need to be. Throughout its small scope and focus, Michaela's story manages to use Dibri's multiverse concepts in a way that's not painfully obtuse to new readers. More than any other story this year, if you don't read DBD lore very much but kinda wanna break into it, and soon the fog is a great place to get started. Especially if you like Michaela's character already. It combines some solid character work with a dribble of wide lore implications for DBD's multiverse, and presents it all in a way that doesn't require any prior knowledge of how DBD's multiverse works. If you're already super enfranchised in this area of the story, I'm not sure it'll offer a lot to you. If you're not a hardcore Michaela stan, that is. But I don't dislike it, and it's a pretty good way to round off the tome stories for 2022. 14 months ago, I made a shitty video about Michaela Reed, and after a while of regretting it, I resolved to make things right when the time came to talk about Michaela again. Do you think I did a good job? If so, please subscribe if you're brand new to the channel, leave a comment, and check out my socials in the description down there for your perusal. In the description you can also find my Patreon. Patrons get a day early access to my videos and a special chat in my Discord server, so if you want to be part of that gang, then the link is down there. And special thanks once again to Wraith Energy for sponsoring everything I do on this channel. Their link is also in the description, and if you pick something up, don't forget to use code PICKLE20 for 20% off at checkout. It means a lot to me, hopefully it'll be good for you. Right, guess I'll see you next time. Ta-ta for now.